Thank you again for all the wonderful music today as we worship the Lord. Good to see all of you. Good morning, Shiloh Baptist Church. Happy New Year to you. Hope that uh, you have already experienced some blessings from the Lord in this brand new year. When Winnie Pierce went off to college, she decided to take some drama classes in the drama department. The director of the drama department was going to put on a play for the community. And the director was looking for someone to play the role of an old mountain woman. And he asked some of the students in the drama department to read some of the script aloud about the old mountain woman. And when Winnie Pierce got up to read, she read that part in her natural mountain accent. And when she finished, the director said, I have found my old mountain woman. And Winnie agreed to play the part. When the opening curtain time came, the night to present the play, the director came back before the curtain opened and said, I need to tell all of you as the cast that the author of this play is here tonight and has come to see you present this play that he wrote. Well, that made Winnie nervous, but she did the best that she could in her part. And after the final curtain call, the director brought the author of the play back to meet the cast. And when he shook Winnie Pierce's hand, he looked at her in the face and would not let go of her hand and said, when I created this old mountain woman, you have exactly become her in this play. You are the flesh and blood of this old mountain woman that I created. The word in the Bible for in the flesh, flesh and blood, is the word incarnate. It means in the flesh. Winnie Pierce had become the old mountain woman incarnate in the flesh. We have just come through the celebration of Christmas time. Christmas is about the incarnation of God. God became flesh and blood. God became man. He is God incarnate. Jesus Christ, born into this world, is God incarnate. God in the flesh, flesh and blood. The Bible puts it this way, if you'll look with me in your Bible, to John's Gospel, chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1. In John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And John writes, We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What's the Bible saying? God became flesh. He became one of us. He took up His dwelling with us in this world. God incarnate. Jesus Christ was the Lord incarnate. He became in the flesh. And what does it say, John say? We saw Him. We saw Him in the flesh. We saw Him in human form. We saw the one and only Son of God. He has become one with us. He is God incarnate. 
in a very real sense, you and I, as believers in Jesus, you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are the continuing incarnation of Christ. That went by you. Let me say it again. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are the continuing incarnation of Christ in this world. We are the flesh and blood body of Jesus Christ in this world. Jesus does not have a body like he had for 33 years. He took that body back with him, glorified as it was in the heaven. So he has no body here, but you and I, who are followers of his, who believe in him, are the flesh and blood of Jesus in our world today. Now I want you to see a verse and I must admit to you as I read this verse with you, this passage boggles my mind to this day. I had the most difficult time for years grasping what Jesus meant in this next passage we're going to read together. It is a mind-boggling passage. You ready for it? John's Gospel, chapter 14. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. <clears throat> it begins in John 14, 12, with Jesus saying, I tell you the truth. Now, when you hear Jesus say that as he's about to tell you something, it's one of those things you can believe. He's going to tell you the truth. First of all, Jesus would never lie to us. But when he says, I tell you the truth, it's an emphasis on you can really believe this. I tell you the truth. What's, what's the truth? Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. <clears throat> Wait a minute now. What did Jesus say? He who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Uh, it, gets, it gets more mind-boggling. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What does Jesus say? I'm going to the Father. I'm about to be gone. I'm going to go back where I came from 33 years ago to heaven to the Father. But when I'm gone, you who believe in me, you who follow me as Lord of life, will do the same things I've been doing in these 33 years of life. In fact, he says, more mind-boggling, you're going to do greater things than I have done. Think with me for a moment. What are some things that Christ did in those 33 years of life in His body upon this earth? God incarnate, God in the flesh. He healed people. He healed the blind, those who could not see, he made to see. He healed the lame, those who could not walk, he made to walk. Those who were ill, he took away their illness and made them well. He even raised the dead. He walked on the water. He stilled the storms. He died on a cross for our sins. He raised up from the grave to be alive again in his glorified body. 
And Jesus says, what I've been doing, you will do. And you will do even greater things than I have done. The question I have, I hope you have as you get into this thought here with me, how can that be? How can I, how can you do the same things that Jesus did in His body How can we do greater things? And the word there is really miracles. How can we do greater miracles than Christ has done? I think we have an answer. A few verses down from verse 12 in John 14 is verse 16. Look with me at John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another counselor, uh, advocate. The word in the scripture is the word paraclete. It means another one like me. He will give you another counselor to what? To be with you, how long? Forever. And who is this one who's coming back from the Father? It's the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, Jesus says. The world cannot accept it. No, it doesn't say it, does it? What does it say? Him. The Holy Spirit's not an it. It's a him. He's a him. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you who follow me, who are my believers, my followers, You know him, for he lives with you and will be where? In you. If I'm understanding all this correctly, and I guarantee you I have struggled and prayed and sought the Lord's will about all this, because this is stuff we all need to know. How can we do the things that Christ has done in His 33 years of life on this earth? How can we do greater things that He's done, He said, that we will do? Because He is going to come back in the form of His Spirit, His Spirit of truth, His Holy Spirit, and He's going to take up residence in your life and in my life as believers, and because He comes to live in us, He will be able to use the flesh and blood body that I have, that you have, to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in every believer's life across this world, and the accumulation of everything He does in me, you, and every other believer across this world will be even greater than the things He accomplished in His 33 years of life. We are Christ continuing incarnation. We are His flesh and blood body in this world today. His body is not here. His body is in me and in you as followers of His. We are Christ's body in this world. Oh, that's, 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 my goodness, that's, 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 that's hard to grasp. Because I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't have a lot of strength. I know I've got a lot of weaknesses. And yet Christ's Spirit has come into me and wants me to be His flesh and blood, incarnation, body in the flesh in this world today, and so the same with you. We are His continuing incarnation. The word for that, the body of Christ, is what? The church. Look with me at the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. Ephesians 1 beginning at verse 22. Ephesians 1, 
22. As you find that place in God's Word, Ephesians 1, 22, follow with me in God's Word. And God placed all things under His feet, Christ's feet, and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church. He is the head of the church, which is what? Which is His body. We who make up the church, we believers in Jesus Christ, we followers of Jesus Christ, who make up the church, the Bible says, which is the body of Jesus Christ, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. He will fill His body with Himself, which is the church. We, as the church, are the body of of Christ. We are Christ incarnate. We are Christ in the flesh. We are His flesh and blood in this world. Have I said that enough for it to sink in yet? We are the body of Jesus Christ. If so, what is to be our function in this world? How do we function as the body of Jesus Christ in this world. Those of us who are believers in Him, who are following Him as our Lord and Savior, together all of us make up the body of Jesus Christ. And how are we to function? Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. The body of Christ is made up of many parts. You and I are the parts that make up the body of Christ. We're many, but many together into one makes one body. That's what the scripture says. It is the body of Christ. Now drop down to verse 14. And stay with me. Don't go to sleep. Stay with me. This is good stuff. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all a part of, if they were all one part, where would the body be? And if there are many parts, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. All of us together form together the one body of Jesus Christ. And I want you to see verse 27. Don't miss verse 27 of that 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. All of us are make up one of the parts that work together with other parts to make up one body. So the function of the body of Christ is that all of us individually, different as we are, young or old as we are, gifted or ungifted, talented or untalented, what, whoever we are, whatever we are, we are an important part of the body of Jesus Christ. We make up the one body 
of Christ. That's how it functions. Many parts, but one body. Somebody has taken this idea of different parts in the body in the church and said some people are like false teeth in the church. Sometimes they're in, sometimes they're out. Some are like tonsils. Sometimes they just get sore about something. Some are like the appendix. You never quite know it's there till it gives you trouble. Someone else has said the body sometimes can be like bones in the body. Some are the jaw bones who only talk. Some are the tail bones who only sit. Some are the back bones who do all the work. Whatever role you play, you are an important part of the body of Christ. You're not the ear, you're not the eye, you're not the foot. You're so, whatever part you play in the body of Christ, whoever you are, whatever you have to offer or to give, you are an important part of the body of Christ. It functions that way. Now look with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Ephesians 4, 16. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. In Ephesians 4, 16, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, and here's the last part that, don't skip that part, that's the important part. As each part does its work. Every part must function for the whole body to function. Each part has an important role. Two weeks ago, I jammed this thumb. You ever jammed a thumb? It's been sore for two weeks now. I've had to compensate because I can't put pressure on it. It hurts so badly when I do that things that this th thumb normally does, I'm having to use other parts of the body to compensate for that thumb that hurts so much. Sometimes in the body, we may have to compensate for those that don't do their job. There may be some people who are doing extra, the thumb and the fingers, because the thumb's not doing its part. Every one of us functions in the body by doing our part. What God has wanted us, placed us to do in the body. I want to share a story with you real quickly. I ran across that I think fits well the, the, the truth. A member of a certain church who previously had been attending very regularly to all the worship services suddenly stopped coming. After a few weeks, a pastor decided to make a visit. It was a chilly evening. The pastor found the man at home alone, sitting before a blazing fire. Guessing the reason for the pastor's visit, the man welcomed him in, led him to a big chair in front of the fireplace, and waited for the pastor to start in. The pastor made himself comfortable, but said nothing. In the silence, he contemplated the play of the flames around the burning logs. After some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs near the fireplace and carefully picked up a brightly burning ember and placed it to one side of the hearth all alone. Then he sat back in his chair and sat silent. The host watched all this in quiet fascination. As the one lone ember's flame diminished, there was a momentary glow, and then its fire 
was no more. Soon it was cold. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting between the pastor and the man. Just as the pastor was getting ready to leave, he picked up the cold ember and placed it back in the middle of the fire. Immediately, it began to glow once more with the light and warmth of the burning coals around it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, his host said, Thank you so much for your pastor visit, and especially for the fiery sermon. I'll be back in church next Sunday. We need each other. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 1.12 says we need each other. We are encouraged by each other. You see, as your interim pastor, I need you. And you need me. I encourage you and you encourage me. I gain from your faith and you gain from my faith. I may be a little bit of a cold ember some Sunday, but you're a burning ember for the Lord, and, and I catch on fire from being around you. And I pray that if you're an ember that's burned down and going out and losing your fire, that maybe some fire from me that the Lord has put there will set you back on fire. We need each other. We need to function together in the body of Christ, each of us doing our part to make the body function as the continuing incarnation, flesh and blood body of Jesus Christ in this world. The last truth I'd share quickly is this. What's to be the goal of the church? If that's the function that we all have a part to play and, and, and need to, to do our part, what's the goal? of the body of Christ. What did Christ have in mind when he put this body together? What was he hoping to accomplish? And I want you to look at Ephesians 4 again, what the Lord's goal for us as his body is. Ephesians 4, this time looking at verse 12 and 13. In Ephesians 4, 12, we are to prepare God's people for works of service. Let me stop there. What did Jesus say in John 14, 12? You're going to do greater things than I've done. How can that be? Because as the body of Christ, we are to help each other, prepare each other to do the works of service that Jesus Christ would have us do so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, grown up, attaining to the whole measure, the full stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Two quick things there in those scriptures. One, we are to build up the body of Christ. How do we build up the body of Christ? Each of us reaching out and touching other lives, people will hear the gospel through me and through you and respond to Jesus Christ and be added to the body of Christ. And the body of Christ grows stronger as people are added to the body of Jesus Christ through our reaching out and touching lives in the name of Jesus Christ. People are brought to the faith and, and to the commitment to follow Jesus Christ and added to the body and it makes the body stronger. What else are we to do in the goal he has for us? We are to become more and more like Jesus Christ to reach His stature, His fullness, as we function as a body of Christ more and more, we will take on the stature, the appearance of Jesus Christ in 
our world. And, and this is hard to say this, but I really believe it with all my heart. When you walk into a classroom at school on a Monday or Tuesday or whenever, when you walk into a business office, when you walk into a grocery store, when you walk into a home, or when you go anywhere, do you know what happens when you walk into those places? Suddenly Jesus Christ is there because you are Jesus in the flesh, incarnate. You are Jesus on the scene. We are to become more and more like Jesus. And one quick word, a story, another story I want to share with you real quickly. It was once a little boy who wanted to meet God. He knew it was a long ways to where God lived, so he packed his suitcase with Twinkies and a six-pack of root beer and started his journey. When he had gone about three blocks, he met an old man who was sitting on a park bench staring at some pigeons in the park. The boy sat down next to him and opened his little suitcase he was about to take a drink from his root beer when he noticed that the old man looked hungry. So he offered him a Twinkie. The old man gratefully accepted it and smiled at him. His smile was so incredible that the boy wanted to see that smile again. So he offered him a root beer. And once again, he smiled at him and the boy was delighted. They sat there all afternoon eating and smiling. As it began to grow dark, the boy realized he needed to get home. So he got up to leave, but before he had gone more than a few steps, he turned around, ran back to the old man, and gave him a big hug. The man gave him the biggest smile ever. When the boy opened the door to his own house, his mother was surprised by the look of joy on his face. She asked him, what did you do today that brought you so much joy? He said, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could respond, he added, you know what? He's got the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the old man, also radiant with joy, returned to his home. His son was stunned by the look of peace and joy on his father's face. He said, Dad, what did you do today that made you so full of joy? He said, I ate Twinkies and drank root beer in the park with God. But before his son responded, he added, you know, he's much younger than I expected. Yeah. Say, preacher, what does all that mean? Jesus said, my spirit will be in you. And you will be my flesh and blood in this world. You will do greater things in your body and life than I have done. For you will be Christ incarnate in the classroom, in the business office, in the home, in the grocery store. Wherever you go, you are the Jesus Christ in the flesh. His body in this world. Will that change your life? <laughs> no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which the Lord looks with compassion on this world. 
Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion upon this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Let's be his body in this world. Let's fulfill what he said would happen, that we'll do greater things than he could do in his one body for 33 years upon this earth. Now his body is made up of all of us who are his believers and followers. And through his spirit in me and you, we can do greater things than even he could do in those 33 years. Does that make this body one of the most important bodies in the whole wide world? Mm -hmm. This church, this body of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I have to admit to you, Father, that there's still some things about your word and this truth that you gave to us that I'm still trying to grasp. But from what I understand, Lord, you chose to make those who follow you a part of your body, the body of Christ in this world. And Jesus, you don't have a body anymore like you did those 33 years after you were born at Bethlehem and grew up and died and resurrected and went back to heaven. But you've got us, those of us who believe in you, who have faith in you, who follow you. We're willing to be your body, flesh and blood, to make Jesus Christ come alive in this world. By the power of your Spirit in us, help us to do our part in the body of Christ to make the body function, and to reach the goal you have for us. It makes the church, this church, and the full church across the world the most important body in the whole world. And I pray, Lord, if there's some folks here that have not been doing their part in the body, that this will be a turning point time in their lives. And they'll be willing to say, Lord, let me do my part faithfully to fulfill the function you have for me in this body of Christ so that we can do what you said would happen. What you've been doing, we will do, and we will even do greater works in the power of your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our hymn of invitation this morning, we still do not have a public invitation, but it is an invitation for you to respond to what the Lord has said to you today. I know the message has been a little heavy, a little deep. But if you can just grasp that you are part of something big, something important, and that Christ is looking to us to fulfill His calling in our lives. Be the church that God wants us to be. And if you haven't yet placed your faith and trust in Him, do so. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Become a part of this important body of Jesus Christ.